All right. I'm launching the poll. And, you know, please share with us what your affiliation is with UCSF and what school you're affiliated with. All right, we'll let you vote for a few more seconds. All right, I'm going to end the polling and let's see our results. All right, can you all see the results? Mm -hmm. About 56 of you are students. We have postdocs, alumni, faculty, and staff in the room. That's great. And we have um, the graduate division is uh, most represented with 38% of you. Um, and next is medicine, pharmacy, and nursing. We're so glad all of you could, uh, could join us today. So let's get started. Thank you, Dr. Becker, for speaking with to us today. And please tell us more how you became an entrepreneurial business executive. Thanks. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks to the UCSF for uh, giving me this opportunity. And thanks to all of you for taking time out of your days uh, to come listen to, to this story. And um, my purpose of doing this is I'm a proud UCSF alum. I'm really excited to have this opportunity to kind of give back to the community. But I'm also really passionate about helping other people with their personal discovery and figuring out what career is going to be right for them. So um, I'd welcome this opportunity. And I, uh, afterwards, after we finish the session, if any of you have other questions, I'm happy to stick around for a few minutes and, and, and talk some more. So my journey begins around the dinner table with my father. Uh, my parents were divorced and I was living with him in high school. And my dad was a professor of medicine here at UCSF. In fact, he uh, founded the Poison Control Center at San Francisco General Hospital and was head of the occupational medicine division for a number of years. And so as you might imagine, our dinner table conversations uh, involve things like, what was that latest overdose? And what happened to the patient's kidneys? And um, what happened when this uh, plant uh, manufacturing something exploded and exposed the workers? Those were our kinds of dinner tables and dinner table conversations. And so I, um, I really enjoyed those kind of uh, the biology of medicine and listening to those cases. But then I also saw the other side of my dad's life, um, living with him in high school, which was that he was a you know, professor and he was working really hard, hustling to write grants, trying to get funding to fund his projects because he loved doing the science. And so my point of sharing you with this with you is that when I went to college, I saw how hard my dad worked. And, uh, and while I liked the intellectual part of it, I was like, that, that, that career, that job is not, not for me. And so I can tell you, when I went to college freshman year, I was convinced the one thing I did not want to do was be a doctor. <laughs> um, and so I went to college and the question is, well, what did I want to do? I had a wonderful history teacher. I was really, um, you know, in, inspired uh, by, by this history teacher and wanted to study philosophy. Um, and my dream, and this will be funny now that you, my dream was to have a ponytail and wear Birkenstocks and be a professor of philosophy at Berkeley. It's kind of funny given, given my hairstyle now. Um, but you can see that, 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 that this journey is going to have lots of twists and turns on it. And I I'm, I'm hope you'll stay with me on this journey um, because I'm hoping that uh, I'm sharing these details with you because I hope that if you're, most of you are students here, I hope you understand that if you're grappling with some of these questions about what are you going to do or what are you not going to do, that that's normal. You're right where you're supposed to be. And that's where I was when I went to freshman year of college. Sure, I didn't want to be a doctor. Sure that I wanted to be a professor of philosophy. Um, and so I was so convinced my first two courses in college, two out of four, um, were philosophy classes, you know, linguistics and political philosophy. And I can tell you, after those first two classes, um, in all my four years of college, those were my two worst grades in all of college. And I was the bug that hit the windshield 
of my dreams of being a professor, I realized I wasn't very good. I just didn't have the mind. I didn't do horribly, but I just, it wasn't easy for me. It wasn't natural. Uh, in parallel, you know, exploring subjects freshman year, I took an economics class and I did great. I did great in economics, but the problem was I didn't really like it. So there I was at the end of freshman year, the thing I was most passionate about, I wasn't very good at. The thing I was good at, I wasn't very passionate about. And I was, I was stuck. Like, I was like, uh-oh, what do I do? <laughs> what do I do? And so I came home after freshman year of college, um, came back home, and with my tail between my legs, I had to go back to my dad and say, Dad, uh, could I work for you this summer? Can I get a job with you? Because I didn't have a job. I didn't know what to do. And of course, he was very kind and happy to help. And so I had that the summer after my freshman year, so summer, um, I got to follow him on rounds. I helped, you know, as, as a research administrator, collecting data and entering it into surveys. Um, but I got to see him on rounds. And I should tell you that um, my father was an excellent teacher. He won several teaching awards while here um, at UCSF, uh, Charles Becker. And, uh, and he always, for his entire career, he attended in the cardiac uh, coronary care unit in July. And for those of you who are medical students, you can appreciate that July is when all the new residents and all the new medical students come on. It's when you have the most junior, the least experienced team handling the cases. And the coronary care unit is one of the most complicated places. And he did that, he took that on and he loved it because he loved helping the students. And so I got to see him in this different light, not of the light of stressing over grants, but the light of helping and teaching students and really being beloved. And, and I felt immediately comfortable in the hospital, very comfortable going on rounds, just intuitively, really interested in the research. And so that summer was transformative for me. I came back like, okay, I guess I'm gonna be a doctor. And so starting sophomore year, I began my pre-med studies. Um, and, and I was the sophomore, few of us, along with most of the freshmen, and I was a year behind, struggling to catch up, but I was on a path. And I said, okay, I'm going to do this. And um, I found that, um, that the science, I loved, I, I was curious about the biology and the, and the chemistry, and I, I enjoyed it, and I had aptitude for it. Um, that was a fit. And I also found a major, um, I went to Harvard undergraduate, and the major was history and science. So it had this very clever way that I could get credit for all my pre-meds, but that not be stuck doing just science. I could do other liberal arts courses to complement. And that was lucky that I found that major. And in doing so, um, I ended up taking a course in the history of American medicine. And this was transformative for me because I still, remember, I still remember to this day, the professor gave a lecture on the history of health insurance plans and how they came to be. You know, we didn't always have Kaiser in the world. We didn't always have uh, HMOs in the world. And I heard that story of how they came to be. And you will now understand why I may be a mutant, but I left that class electrified. I remember it to this day, I was, that was it. I was, I said, that was so interesting to me because it not only was medicine and healthcare, that was, but it was at a bigger level. It was at a society level. It was how these things were organized to improve the care, not just of one patient at a time, but of many patients at a time. And the notion of, of thinking that there were these organizations within healthcare that could do that was tremendously instant, uh, exciting to me. And so in that moment, I discovered my passion. And that's maybe the first thing to just take a pause from my story and just underscore for you is pay attention to these moments in your life when something electrifies you and captures your attention in a compelling way because that passion uh, will be very helpful for you in figuring out the rest of your journey. And for me, that was the first step I mean, maybe it was the second stake in the ground. The first was healthcare and medicine in general. But the second was that I found a way that it wasn't, uh, that it was at a, a society level of impacting lots of patients. And I 
that became my passion. And that is still my passion to this day about thinking about ways to impact the care of lots of patients. So I was lucky in that I found that kind of midway through my college. And then the question became, well, that's a concept. How does that turn into a career? And remember, I think it's just, I, not remember, it's fair to say that I, ha I, I had, you know, ambivalence about medical school. Like, did I really want to do this? And, and, and so I continued to explore, continued to work hard at my pre-med classes to give myself the option. But I became more and more interested in this concept of health insurance. And so I actually did an honors thesis in the history of Harvard Community Health Plan. I learned a lot about them through that process. And I asked my college advisors, I said, look, if I want to run an HMO, which is what I wanted to do when I graduated college, how do you run an, how do you run an HMO? Who does that? What do you do for that? And they said, look, if you know you want to be in healthcare, go to medical school. And that was pretty, that was good advice for me. Um, and I said, okay. And so I finished pre-med courses, took MCATs, applied, was very lucky to get in to UCSF, uh, came back to UCSF where I did have the, 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 privilege of having my dad teach a couple classes but most importantly i got to see the wonderful you know other students in my class and i have to say in my whole career you know that was the most intense academic experience with the smartest group of people i've ever been a part of 141 of us um and it was an incredible group and it was intense as you were in the medical school know we learned a lot um i i uh, was able to keep up and uh, enjoyed learning, continued to learn about the science as I've always learned about it. But I have to say, I was different. I was different from the get-go, right? I, I didn't come in wanting to be a surgeon. I didn't come in wanting to be a pediatrician. I came in wanting to run an HMO. That's not, that's maybe not, not the average uh, student who starts. And on that journey, um, as I continued through my classes, I was lucky to meet some mentors. And my first mentor was uh, um, Steve McPhee, who's a wonderful uh, now retired professor in primary care. And so he educated me about primary care and how to, how to think about doing real good clinical studies. And the other mentor was Phil Lee, who was at the um, Institute for Health Policy Studies. And through the combination of those influences, and, I, and maybe I'll pause and underscore that because I, I think some of the questions may, may, may deal with this later is when you meet important mentors or opportunities to have mentors, it's a very precious gift. And, um, and I encourage you all to take advantage of that. Whenever you have some, some experienced person that you look up to, um, try to continue to spend time and learn what you can from them. And I, 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 did that and I committed to doing actually an extra year after my third, between my third and fourth year of medical school, I took a whole year off. Now, most of the time when people take a year off of medical school, they work in a lab, they do science projects and that's the typical and that's a good and wonderful thing. And if you're doing that or thinking about it, I think it's a great experience. But I think as you're getting the sense, I maybe don't do things the standard way. And so what did I do? I invented a new kind of third year experience and I created it. I don't, I don't remember the details of how I did this, but I created what I termed a uh, pre-doctoral fellowship. It, 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 I just made it up. It's pre-doctoral, I didn't have my doctorate, so it was pre-doctoral fellowship. And I, I arranged this year where I wrote for grants, I got funded, and I spent a third of the year at the Centers for Disease Control doing epidemiology work. I spent a third of the year at the Institute for Health Policy Studies publishing research. And I did a third of the year at, um, in Washington, DC. And for context, the year was 1993. Um, many of you may not even have been born yet. <laughs> but for those who, who studied your history in school, that was when Bill Clinton had been elected in his first term. And even before Obamacare, there was a great interest to reform health care. And if you remember my mentor, Phil Lee, Phil Lee was the, uh, I think the only person who's ever been the two-time assistant secretary of health. So my mentor, just through luck, 
was tapped to be the assistant secretary of health um, working in the Clinton administration. And so I said, well, that sounds pretty neat. And I took the opportunity to follow his coattails. And as one third of my pre-doctoral fellowship, I lived in Washington, DC, and I hung out when all of this work was happening around trying to, trying to bring in experts to figure out how we should change healthcare. You know, if you can imagine Obamacare, imagine all the work and planning that went into that. There was the same kind of effort back in 1993. And so when I went in really excited thinking, well, maybe, maybe it's health policy, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe not HMOs, maybe, maybe health policy, I'll really check it out. And what I had, and I had a fantastic experience, you know, hang out, uh, you know, I was in the room when it happened, to quote Hamilton, when all of these discussions happened about exciting changes in healthcare. And I, and I was just listening. I had no agenda other to take notes and meet these people. And I thought, huh, maybe I'll, when I went into it, I thought maybe I'll do healthcare policy. Or maybe I'll do the epidemiology from the Centers for Disease Control and study how infections happen, you know, pre-COVID-19, think about that. Uh, or maybe I'll be an academic doing health policy work with people like Kevin Grumbach and others. And when I came back from that experience, I got to say, I batted O for three. <laughs> I didn't want to do this, the epidemiology work. I didn't want to be the, I validate again that I didn't want to be the academic professor. I liked the studies, but I didn't want to do that for a career. And then even this most exciting pinnacle of time in Washington, DC, I realized that the people that make health policy are either senior people like you know, my mentor, Phil, who was appointed or an elected official, or somebody who's been slogging away in the bowels at HHS for like 10 years. And I was like, I don't see myself doing that. So, so if you're seeing a, a theme here, like I kind of went trying a bunch of different things and they were all exciting. They were all fabulous experiences, but they all validated that that wasn't a path I wanted to take. And so if you're coming into it, so I, I'm just going to pause again and just say, if you're having experiences, you know, first go for it, try them, go be creative about exposing yourself to things, but be open to the outcome that it may not, you may not like, it may not be a career path for you. So, so back to the story, I came back for my fourth year of medical school. And you can imagine the state I was in. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> none of those pathways are going to work for me. What am I going to do? And I finished my clinical rotations and I did some work in bioinformatics work with Ron Aronson in the radiology department and published a paper there that was sort of like, oh, maybe I'll do some informatics stuff. But, but the point is, most of my friends at UCSF, my classmates, they knew what they wanted. They wanted. To, I remember the guys that wanted to be orthopedic surgeons, or an ENT, or a psychiatrist, or a neurologist, or a, or a family physician. I had all of my friends like that's what they're going to do, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea. There was no specialty that particularly interested me. Uh, and I actually, if you can believe it, I actually ended up ranking in two different specialties. I, that was, I, was that, I was that confused. And I kind of ranked in one prestigious academic place and then a bunch of emergency medicine places. I mean, I was all over the map, to be honest. And I just, I just kind of won the lottery and then I got really lucky and got accepted to go to Mass General. Um, maybe, maybe they saw something in my crazy, crazy pre-doctoral fellowship, but I, I, I got into Mass General, went there in the primary care medicine program, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll I'll be here. And I got to tell you, the Mass General was a wonderful fit for me. I love the place, love the people. And it was a, it's a, it, back then, I'm sh it may have changed now, but it was a, it was hardcore. It was one of the few places back in the 90s that was doing um, call every third night. Uh, most places then were doing four, and I think now they're sort of four or five day call. Um, so you were exhausted, but I learned a ton. You take call by yourself. And so I became, I had my own clinic out in the, out in the suburbs. Uh, I, be, I transformed, I, be, I became a doctor and I learned how to take patients. I had my own patients and it was very empowering. And I learned, though it was really scary at times, I learned that I could do it, that I could be a doctor. And all of a sudden that ability to know that I could do it, it I guess it could have gone a couple of ways, but 
for me, it caused me to be proud of it. But at the same time, I was also like, step, it got me to step back and say, what, what am I doing? Like, I, I, I am on the path to have a clinic. Like, I know I could do this. I could, I could be a doctor. I could be a pretty good doctor. I could, but, but I didn't, I, it like, it didn't touch my soul. And I don't know how to explain that, but to say, listen, listen to what that soul says to you. And I just didn't see myself in a path in a clinic, taking care of patients. Now, I did something radical at this point that I do not recommend, but, uh, you know, to be honest, one of the traits of many entrepreneurs is we're not very patient. And I was not very patient. And what did I do? I took that experience and said, well, I, I've, I've deferred my dream of learning business. I still ha had some aspirations of working in the business side of healthcare. And I'm, I've spent six years learning medicine, but I have not learned about business. I need to go learn business. And so I, 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 I jumped out of the plane without a parachute and I left Mass General that I'd worked so hard to get after my internship in medicine and jumped out to go get a job. And I said, I got to go get a job in business. Now I got to tell you this, this part of the story, I do not recommend that. <laughs> if I had to do it over again, and I made this decision like post call, right? Um, uh, but I, but, but I said, I just, I just got to do it. Um, in retrospect, I probably should have stayed and finished to give me more career options, but I, I wasn't patient. So I literally went back to the undergraduate office of career services with all the other undergrads. And I said, I'm going to get a job in business. And I interviewed at a bunch of the top consulting firms. And um, if you can imagine, I was interviewing for these jobs post call. I was exhausted. And, and it's kind of comical. I can laugh about it now, but I didn't laugh about it then. I was, in retrospect, I was woefully underprepared. I was so unprepared. You can imagine, I, I was just totally taking care of patients. And then I was interviewing with McKinsey people asking me about telecommunications in South America. I had no idea what I was doing. I was totally making it up. And I got to say, they were so nice to me. They were so nice to me. Like it was, it was, the, it was one of the few times I, I was so unprepared and they were just nice to me the whole time. And at the end of that completely humbling situation, I got exactly one job offer. I got one job offer and I took it. I took it. I ended up going to this uh, consulting firm called APM. It wasn't a McKinsey. It wasn't a BCG or Bain. But it was founded by a bunch of um, ex-McKinsey partners, and they had a niche in healthcare. And that is why they hired me, because I knew something about health policy. And they liked me for that, and that was the one job I got. I took it. And that was a really transformative experience for me also. That was, I consider that my business school. Um, and because I, I, I think they gave me credit for my MD and they hired me as a post MBA level. I was not qualified at all. I don't know why, but, but anyway, they just threw me in there. And, and I remember, um, uh, the transformation was challenging, but good for me. I remember saying to myself at the beginning of that, well, I'm I'm not going to wear a suit because I remember the consulting suits coming to the hospitals and doing their work. And so I always wore like tweed coats and things kind of professorly just because that helped me hold on to my physician identity. But as you can imagine, after about a year of doing that and traveling, I eventually put the tweed coats away and I, I became one of the suits and I learned Excel and I learned PowerPoint. I learned how to do presentations. Um, I learned how to, uh, do a lot of different uh, reorganized hospitals, how to save costs at hospitals, how to do strategy projects for physician groups. It was a, it was a wonderfully educational, uh, hard, intense, in some ways, just like the first two years of UCSF medical school, but now in, my, in a business framework. And I learned a lot of core business skills. But ultimately, and so period, I just, I learned and I, I, I then had the choice uh, after I'd done that, do I go back to residency or do I continue? And I said, I think I'm gonna continue. Um, and along the way, the dreams of the HMO had faded by the wayside, but my passion remained. I still remained committed to healthcare. That hadn't wavered a bit. I had not a doubt about that. 
I had not le lost a doubt of my commitment to want to work with patients on a broader level. Um, and I was beginning to get a little bit clearer that I kind of was intrigued on this business side, but I didn't quite know what that meant to do. And so I said, look, after consulting for a couple of years, it was very educational, but it's a hard life. You're traveling four days a week and it's not much of a life. I said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get an, I'm going to go now work at a company. And I said, my thing that I'm passionate about is technology. I'm going to come to a technology company. And so I came back after two years of consulting back. Um, I, I said, I'm going to get a job. And I got a job offer to come to a venture backed company in Silicon Valley. It was kind of luck that I'm back here. I could have been in Tennessee, uh, where the other, other or Minnesota were other hotbeds of medical innovation. I just happened to get a job back here. And I was in a venture backed company by two good venture companies doing software for managing physician risk. So it wasn't any sexy technology, but it was some kind of technology and it was in healthcare and it was venture backed. And that, that, that was sort of luck that it was venture backed. And I just kind of fell into that. But I began to get operating experience and I began to to see, okay, this is how it works in a company and get a little bit of experience. And then one thing to be open to is sometimes bluebirds will come into your life, like these random potentially seismic events. And mine came in the form of, a, you know, I'm in my late 20s and friends were starting to get married and I went to a friend's wedding. And at this friend's wedding, I met, met a, a, a former high school classmate of mine who was a uh, investor and VC. And you, to set context, this was in 1996, 97. If you can imagine, Amazon was just starting up. And I met this venture capital investor friend of mine from high school um, who I hadn't seen in a few years. And she said she wanted to start a, a business. And I said, hmm, well, what are you thinking of? And she goes, why? I'm, I'm thinking of what's the next thing? If Amazon's shipping books, what's the next thing that's small and shippable? And we said, pills. Pills are the next thing that's small and shippable. And thus was born the idea for a company. And uh, we worked together. We sort of worked at nights and on the sideline putting together presentations. And eventually we got you know, some top tier venture capitalists to give us, uh, you know, $7 million to go start this, what was a 15 page PowerPoint presentation and turn it into a business. Um, and so we did, that was the beginning of what would become Planet RX. Uh, this is in the late nineties. Uh, this is .com 1.0 for those who use that. And so I quit the other job, uh, joined this full time, threw myself into it. And it was just like what you've seen in the movies where you're working night and day, uh, hustling to build this business off the ground. And so you may be asking, well, what, what were you doing? Like you're this doctor guy, what were you doing? And the question is as a startup, as an entrepreneur, you do everything. I hired the people for the team. I signed the leases for the copier machine. Like you do everything and it was great. And I loved it and I was excited about it. And I found the other side of entrepreneurship is not, it's not so much the skills, like you just work hard and you figure stuff out and you guys are all talented, you all figure stuff out. But, um, and it's also the will to work hard, which everybody in this room has. But it's also, I found it was the ability to keep cool when everything was chaotic around you. And somehow all of that training at UCSF, all of those times a third year medical stu student staying up late to figure out what to do with the patients, or as an intern attending on the ICU, trying to keep track of all the data, all of that, I'll call it clinical skills, but I could also say it's project management skills, but it's also just keeping your cool. It, it all just came to bear and I was calm. In the midst of the storm, I, I was calm and I eventually found my role as happens as founders of companies, you got to find some role. I eventually became the, what was called the launch director. And I was responsible for getting the product out and running. I think they'd call it a product manager today, but we called it launch director. And I had to 
and I, and I found on my point to you as medical students or graduate students is all that training, keeping track of data, being organized, being a, a good project manager is like 80% of the core skill to be a successful entrepreneur. And it's funny, I say that I was literally talking to a, a co-founder, one of my clients now, and he said, he's an engineer, but he said, yeah, I'm, I'm the CEO, I'm, I'm the project manager. So it, it just comes down to kind of being organized and persistent and creative in problem solving. So that was Planet RX. It was the go-go late 90s. We raised, uh, we raised um, a lot of money quickly. I learned about working with venture capitalists. We scaled the business. We ramped it up to $40 million annual run rate in a year and a half. I mean, just fantastic growth. But for perspective, in those days, it was all about customer acquisition. I remember going to raise venture capital money and they would say to us, well, whatever you do with this money, you're not going to get profitable too quickly, right? I said, right. So, uh, so the point is we weren't profitable. We were just acquiring customers. And then what happened it was all, we took the company public with Goldman Sachs. You know, the thing was that we were a unicorn before there were unicorns, but the whole business model was built on, uh, was built on continued growth and raising additional capital. And the markets, as things happen, like COVID-19, you're seeing that markets can change rapidly. In 1999, boom, the markets closed. And so all of a sudden, all of this business model that we had built, like with raising money and acquiring customers, and we were a leader, um, it, it, it's, it didn't work. There was no more money coming in. And so I went from, you know, running our big partnerships and doing, managing a lot of things, the company, to all of a sudden, I was closing down the company. And at the end of the day, I closed it down and I took with me uh, my tombstone for going public and my chair. And that is, and the experience of an entrepreneur, which I learned that was my thing. I had found it. I was, I could do this. I was comfortable. Um, even if this one didn't persist, I, I, I liked it. Um, so then the next phase was to, to pivot to, uh, you know, to find the next job. And so this is maybe something for entrepreneurs. People ask, how do you do entrepreneurship? Well, you're, one of the skills you're going to get is be skilled at finding the next job. You either got to invent the next company or find the next job. Um, so, uh, so I did and networking ended up um, interesting having two job opportunities this time. And I had a choice between joining a hot um, biotech platform company that was do, invented the gene chip for sequencing. Those of you in the, uh, will we'll know the AFI gene chip, those in the graduate science school. Um, or I could have been head of website development for Kaiser. So here we are 10 years later, and I had the choice to go work for an HMO or go into biotech for an exciting tools, you know, diag tools company. And that was the next, that was the next maybe big inflection point in my career. Do I go back to this Kaiser thing and try to do it? And after a very hard decision, I, 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 that entrepreneurial experience at Planner X had changed me. And I wanted the entrepreneurship. I wanted to be building things and creating things. And I was, to be honest, scared of working in a big bureaucratic environment like Kaiser. And so I turned away from what had been my dream in college and turn towards being an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. Um, and I was the first physician that Affymetrics hired and I built, my job was there to build kind of the clinical market. And, and so I did that. And along the way, I had a slide that I used to say, this is in 2002, someday somebody will take a piece of the gene, the human gene expression, and they will use that to diagnose diseases. And they'll use another piece to predict who's gonna respond to which diseases. And so lo and behold, three years later, a company came along that said, we want to do that. And I got hired as their head of commercial. We started using a certain kind of technology, mass spec, for those of you in the lab, and I learned a lot about mass spec. And, we, and I, my job was to do the clinical studies. So here, here I was back doing clinical studies for a technology, and we did the studies. We designed really good studies with the top-notch clinical advisory board including Peter Carroll from UCSF, who's one of our advisors, who's a wonderful man. Um, and you know what? The science just didn't work. Just didn't work. And so that's maybe another lesson for entrepreneurs. You, you've got to be, sometimes there's business failure at Planet RX, 
And sometimes there's technical failure, like at what became Predicant Biosciences, and it just didn't work. And so, once again, I was looking for a job, but this time something unusual happened. The venture capitalists that invested liked the work that I and the CEO had done so much that they said, we want to put you into another company. I, I, I think this happens that once you get in the network, like people spot talent, and they want to keep the talent around. And, um, and so for six months, I basically was like a venture capitalist pulled up at Versant Ventures on Sand Hill Road, which is where a lot of the VCs are. And my job was to find a company for them to put us into. And miraculously we did, and we found a company that was actually using the gene chip, the AFI gene chip as the diagnostic platform. And the company was trying to commercialize this thing for a cancer test. So the venture capitalists put money in, we were joined with the, that other founding team and we were off to the races. And that experience, and so now you can see I'm sort of moving in biotech, moving closer into diagnostics, using my biotech knowledge. So you're building, you're using the skills that you build. And I was the commercial person. And along the way, we worked hard. We got the thing FDA cleared. We launched it. We trained the sales team. And then the CEO said to me, Sean, you've launched the product. I now need you to go talk to the insurance companies to get it paid. And I was like, I don't, you know, I'm a commercial guy. Like, I don't, what do I know about the insurance companies? And he said, well, look, the medical directors at insurance companies are doctors. You're a doctor. You'll figure it out. And so, you know, this is whatever, 15 years ago, I sort of fell into this notion of reimbursement. I didn't know anything about it. And it turned out to be a really good fit for me because it involved very important commercial issue for the team. If you don't get reimbursement, the, the company's not going to work. To persuade the insurance companies, you needed to do good clinical science, good clinical studies, which I had been doing along the way. Um, and uh, and so and so, I be I hired a bunch of good consultants. They trained me. We were actually successful in getting Medicare to cover. I hired a team. We got a handful of commercial payer coverage policies and contracts. And so I found in this story of staying true to your passion, but also finding that what you're good at, I sort of lucked into this. I was actually, without knowing it, I was pretty good at this. Like I could talk, I could develop the right clinical studies. I could present them clearly to the insurance companies. I could persuade them to cover and lo and behold, we got the coverage. And through that work, we got the company up to about 10 million in revenue. It took seven years and I did all the things involved in reimbursement. We got codes, we submitted claims. I just learned by doing, which is a fun part of entrepreneurship, um, but found that, 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 that I, this is something that I could do and that it met my, my combination of interests and skill sets. And after seven years there, I was recruited to go to this company, iRhythm Technologies, where I was basically the head of marketing and reimbursement. I reprised my role and all the lessons I had learned over seven years at Pathwork Diagnostics, I got to apply to this company. And when I joined that company, they were about at 10 million and we applied all those lessons. This time I could do it a lot faster because I knew what to do from day one. And that company, we pivoted their strategy and the CEO hired a bunch of good, um, really good other commercial people, sales people, customer success people, finance people, and working all together as a team, we turned that company uh, we, we, we evolved the strategy and got that company moving in the right direction. And that company took off and that company eventually exited and went public and it's, you know, seen as a successful company today. So, so the last part of the story is, you know, after, after kind of seeing this company start to take off, I said, look, I've done this twice. I'm now, I didn't plan for it, but I'm, I'm a reimbursement and commercial guy. Like I, I kind of know how to do this. I've got 15 years of entrepreneurial experience. I've got you know, 10 or 15 years of reimbursement experience, I can do this. And, and you know what, like, I've, I've got a kind of a playbook, like I got a vision, I know, I kind of know how to do this. And the question in my mind was, well, if my mission back to my mission was to help patients improve the care of lots of patients, I've kind of figured out how to do that one company at a time with my special skill set. But is there a way that I could help do it across more than one company at a time? How can, I, how can I scale myself or make this more? You hear in Silicon Valley, scalability. Well, 
something to ask yourself is how do you scale yourself? And so I said, you know, I can do this by starting a firm where I can work with more than one customer at a time, more than one company at a time. And so that's how I got to uh, found now five years ago today, or five years ago, um, Silver Cat Advisors, which is my consulting firm. And that's what I do. I basically do what I had done at the last two companies, which is running, you know, the marketing and reimbursement. But instead of like being an operator on site all the time, I coach and teach and come up with strategies and then help the companies implement them. And so, and so that's a way that I've been able to, you know, and that's what I'm doing today. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy and I'm really enjoying it. And I'm, I'm having fun. Um, uh, and, and I will say that's the, the story. If you you know, following this along and I appreciate everybody's engagement is, you know, it's this slow, it's not planned. It's, it's having experiences. It's being open to what you learn from those experiences, both things you like, things you don't like, things you're not good at, things you are good at, and letting, and that path will emerge. It's, I was thinking as a metaphor, I think when I was in medical school, I sort of imagined it worked like a puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, right? I'm just looking for that piece. Like if I could just find the mentor, if I could just find the opportunity, it'll fall into place and the picture will be clear. And instead, I think if we're going to use the game metaphor, it's more like a game of dominoes right? Like there's a, there's a field of play in front of you. You've got a hand. You have to interact with, with what is in front of you and it's constantly changing. And it's that ability to kind of interact with what's in front of you is what will help you find that intersection of your passion and your expertise. So thank you for listening and we'll turn over to questions. Great. Thanks, Dr. Becker. So we do have a couple good questions already queued up. And of course, if anyone else would like to ask additional questions, send them in the chat to Rosie Dillon, and she will, um, she will uh, provide those to me to ask um, Dr. Becker. So our first question is, it sounds like you followed a trial and error or leap of faith approach uh, to transition to entrepreneurship. Are there any other strategies you took to ensure you made informed decisions in your pursuit of the different business opportunities? Thank you for the question. So, yeah, so there is absolutely, you must take a disciplined approach to investing every opportunity in front of you. And I didn't, I didn't uh, layer into my story all the other kinds of companies or opportunities I looked at and discarded because they, they, you know, they didn't make sense or I didn't, I didn't believe in them. Um, but you should. And the questions when people ask me about how do you evaluate an opportunity, I think there's, there's typically a few questions I'd encourage you to ask. The first is, um, does the company need what you can bring? Does the company need what you can bring? Because it may be a really interesting company, but if they don't, they don't kind of need what you bring, it's not going to work. The second thing is, do you think the company is going to be successful? It's the best thing you can do for your career is work at a successful company. So you want to make your own judgment about the commercial prospects. And, you know, I may, I'm, I'm probably a pretty slow learner, but I've learned along the way, like, you know, you got to check the business model, make sure you believe in it. And there's always risk in these things. Nothing's 100%, but make sure you believe as much as possible it's going to work. And number three, you need to ask yourself about the cultural fit. We haven't talked about that as much today, but as, especially as a consultant, I can tell you every company has a different culture. It's, uh, it's amazing to me. It's, I, I may write an article about this someday. Um, and the culture comes from the CEO whether both consciously and unconsciously in ways it permeates all the cracks of the institution. So you just will see if you fit the company. It may be a company where you can make an impact with your skills. It may be a company that you think is gonna be successful, but the cultural fit may not be right. And if the cultural fit is not right, don't do it. Uh, you, you will either be, you either won't last or you won't be happy. Uh, so, um, so I hope that answered your question. Like, do 
evaluate the opportunities um, critically uh, before before jumping in. Great, thank you. That's really good. Uh, we had a question that came in um, that I thought was very interesting. It's in medicine, it seems that publicly revealing major failures as a medical trainee or physician is still stigmatized, shame-inducing, and has serious ramifications for future career options. Whereas in entrepreneurship, as you've spoken about, revealing big business failures seems to happen all the time, and there seems to be plenty of career opportunities to move on from failures. Any suggestion about how this cultural phenomenon in medicine can become more like entrepreneurship? Hmm. Great question. Um, well, first of all, that, that's a cultural question. And as I just said, culture comes from the top. Um, I do believe that there are cultures in medicine that do embrace uh, failure to a degree. For example, one of the classics in medicine has been M&M, you know, morbidity and mortality, where you review what happened. So I, 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 think, um, I think that there is an opportunity to learn, but, but, but I, I, I understand what you're saying, that in general, medicine is less comfortable making visible, and certainly outside of the cloister of uh, you know, physician training. Uh, about failures, um, but my my answer is it's, it's it's pretty simple. It needs to come from the from the top. It needs to come from culture, and hopefully somebody in this room will either be part of the next generation that will move into leadership and make that part of the culture, and we'll look for ways to to bring that over. Um, it is interesting just to comment on the the failure thing about in Silicon Valley on the business side. It's absolutely true. Um, um, because people, uh, you know, when you, when things don't go well, as long as you can explain the reasons and they uh, and people understand the reasons, you know, having a failure is almost a badge of honor. It means, it means you had the guts to put yourself out there. And a big thing in entrepreneurship is having those guts. If you don't have the guts to tolerate failure, then you shouldn't be there. It's just not the right fit for you. So. Failure actually means you have courage and failure is assumed that you learn things and the ability to articulate those lessons learned will be important for, uh, you know, for your next opportunity. Great, thank you so much. Here's another great question that's come in. Understanding that this is an extraordinary time now, how do you see the healthcare landscape changing due to COVID-19? And how can entrepreneurship play a role? What advice do you have for students graduating in the current economy as they navigate jobs in healthcare? So, um, okay, so let, let's talk about COVID-19 and opportunities, and then let's talk about students. I'll break those up into two parts. So first, COVID-19, it's, you know, it's, um, it's a pandemic, as everybody knows, many lives have lost, the country was woefully unprepared in terms of testing, and that's a tragedy. But, um, you know, with the Silicon Valley mindset, you know, uh, as I said, failures are opportunities, <laughs> and certainly business opportunities. And I can tell you from kind of being on the front lines, it's been trans, it's transformative for healthcare in a couple of ways. Number one, telehealth, which has been bubbling, uh, you know, percolating in the background for the past 10 years really started to take off about two years ago when CMS was starting to put in place some structures to enable it, but it was very fragmented. It was not consistent. COVID-19 uh, has released, un because people can't access their doctors or afraid to go to, the, um, to their doctors or to the clinics, has in a emergency way, wiped away a lot of the barriers. So telehealth has advanced from my perspective, like by five to seven years, just in the last month. And this is providing a lot of business opportunities for telehealth companies, both those that were in it and those that are jumping into it in all kinds of ways. So that's number one. The second is there's also technology opportunities. I mean, I mentioned diagnostic testing, that's gonna continue to be an opportunity. Um, 
and of course on the on the you know pharmaceutical development with looking for treatments and cures. But even on the platform side, um, you know something that had been an evolving barrier had been regulatory. You know the FDA, and I can tell you that the FDA has been evolving. So it kind of like it's analogous to, to telehealth. Like it had the, the FDA, like ten years ago, it was the biggest barrier. Like it was just so such ossified bureaucracy, so difficult. But over the last few years, um, for those who don't know, there was a former venture capitalist who was head of the FDA, and boy, did that help things start to move in the right direction. And now with the COVID nineteen, the FDA is really moving quickly. Just as one anecdote, I have a client who literally was working on something else, the FDA became available through their regulatory consultant. They said, would you mind putting in something? Like the FDA is asking for someone to do something and the FDA is like getting back to them within minutes. Unheard of. Usually they're on like a 90 day clock. So this COVID-19 has absolutely, though it's a tragedy, it's mobilized things for technology, for innovative technologies on both the electronic and, and pharmaceutical and diagnostic realms in big ways that's gonna, I think, catalyze it. Um, so lots of opportunity opening up. In terms of you know, student opportunities now, well, n number one, first of all, whenever you, know, you guys are of the age where you've been through you know, the 2008, 2009 financial crisis, and so a general lesson is when crises happen, economic crises, it's good to be in school. School's a really great place to be. So, uh, so those of you who have the opportunity to, 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 to be in school, you know, in, enjoy it, take advantage of it, because uh, it's, it's, it's a really good place to let this, uh, this wave of financial distress wash over the country. For those who need to go you know, into work, um, I think medic, at least medical, medical and dental and pharmacy careers are relatively spared. You know, there'll still be the need for doctors. That's going to come back already. Elective procedures are coming back online. So I, I mean, I'm not plugged into medical education, but I think the, the near-term residency tracks and all that are, are intact. I think the, the, you know, the other question is, how will those who are already in practice, since we have some alumni, how will, how will your worlds change? And I think that, um, I think that you can connect the dots to what I said earlier, that tele your world is going to move towards telehealth. Like if, if you are in a kind of clinical career that can work with telehealth, I would encourage you to jump on that train because that train has left the station and it's only picking up speed. Um, if your specialty is not one that embraces telehealth, for example, you know, surgeries, you can't do surgery by, by a telehealth, um, you know, you're going to need to, you're going to need to think about ways to set it up to make it comfortable for patients and, and work because COVID-19 is going to be with us for, for a while. So those are my, my high level thoughts. Sounds good. Well, thank you again for your time and insight. And before we'll do one more question before we officially end um, and stop recording. And so if anybody would like to stay on the meeting a little bit longer after we finish this final question, Dr. Becker is going to stay on a little longer too, and we can unmute everybody and have a little bit more of a casual, um, you know, connection um, between you and Dr. Becker. So we'll just, uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, but let me go to the final official question for you, Dr. Becker. So we've had, a, you know, if someone's had a lot of um, ideas about possible business startups, but always assume someone has done this already, what is your idea for students to research the area of interest prior to getting started to make sure they're not recreating or copying a business model that already exists? Okay, I, I love this question because it gives me an opportunity to, to, to bring up something about entrepreneurship. Um, so first of all, it's the notion of doing your homework to study the market, to study the opportunity, that's important. Um, I think something that sometimes gets underweighted is what I will call customer discovery. Like it's one thing to have a business idea, it's another thing to really understand who's going to pay you for that. There's a lot of things out there that are interesting or even beneficial or helpful there's a smaller subset of things that people will are willing to pay for. And so 
my, my first point is uh, don't be afraid in your research phase to, to actually do some customer discovery. And even if that means, you know, you have a few of you working, you know, in your garage or in your bedroom and you need to go, you know, figure out how to talk to an integrated delivery network. Well, you, you figure it out, go talk to, you know, figure out how you can go talk to some integrated delivery networks, even if they're big and far away and learn about, you know, their interest in it. I think that that last bit of like how the money flows is not often done enough in, uh, in, in kind of business concept phase. So that's number one. But number two is to your question about, well, let's just say that we find 10 or 15 or 20 other companies doing the same thing. Um, it's true that it is important, especially from a fundraising perspective, to have some kind of, the VCs use the term, unfair competitive advantage. You have to come up with a way to think, whether it's a proprietary technology or an, or an approach or just a problem, you, you, you that's kind of, you need to have that some kind of, of something unique about it. But even, even if it's, you know, a moderately strong differentiator, people often forget about the operational challenge of bringing entrepreneurial ideas to market. And um, as someone who's been doing this for 20 years, I can tell you that this, that VCs invest in teams you know, there, there's a saying like they invest in ideas, sure, but like they're really investing in teams. And the reason they invest in teams is because those teams, it's not that those teams know exactly how to get from point A to point P. It's that those teams have shown success in being able to navigate all the hurdles that come up. So my point is don't be afraid of competition, but think about the operational side, how you can you know, beat the competition. What can you do to execute your idea? It, it, it is so unappreciated that people tend to, here in Silicon Valley, they tend to wait the idea, but a lot of it is the execution. You know, you look at like Facebook. Well, Mark Zuckerberg had a great idea, but he really needed Sheryl Sandberg to help execute it. You know, th there's a lot of stories in Silicon Valley of people who can not just have the idea, but then combine it with the team to execute it. So when you're doing your thing about your ideas, if you don't have the, the expertise in execution, maybe bring someone into your team who does, and they can help bring credibility to your venture and help you think through how to beat, um, how, to how to differentiate yourself from the other competitors. And don't be afraid of competition. Think about how to beat them. Awesome. Thank you again, Dr. Becker, for sharing your story today and your journey of how you became. And thank you to everyone who's joined us. Uh, we're going to stop the recording, but not end the meeting. So if you would like to stay on a little bit longer, um, we're happy to have you. Uh, if not, you're free to, to go and finish the rest of your day. Take care, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.